But okay. <clears throat> I am not going to be fucking talking very much. It's gonna be maybe I'll respond to some of the things that are being said, but I am not gonna talk while the talking is happening. Dudes. General Arnie's Educational Center. Corporation for Earth Media Applicant Studio Mongoose. So, I'm also going to be looking at lore stuff while there's no talking going on. GA12, general audience plus 12. Educational content. So this is for, like, school children of the of 12, of 12 and up. And in clearance, admin region, Studio Mongoose, Corporation for Earth Media. Interesting. Length of media, 33.4 SPS. What does that mean, I wonder? Can't mean seconds. Language English. This is an official message of the provisional authority of your jurisdiction. Removal or alteration of this message, violation of 12 PS code SS117. Uh, Substituting this placard into another work for the purpose of conveying, or in a manner reasonably calculated to convey, a false impression of sponsorship or approval by the provisional authority forbidding criminal violation is investigated by central law enforcement, constitute a felony with a maximum penalty up to five years in prison and or a $20,000 fine. Woo! The Corporation for Earth Media is proud to present this educational program. Produced in conjunction with the frontier scientists, engineers, and artists of the Chronos 7 expedition. South Scrimshaw is made possible through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. After one Earth. Sixty six point eight hours. This is not sixty six point eight hours. <laughs> Hot sunlight shines through the veined membrane of an aquatic egg. It was once carried in deeper, cooler waters of a more northern latitude. Now it bobs freely in a subtropical shallow. The consciousness dawning inside is prodded alert in discomfort. It is a male whale calf, stirring with a newfound awareness of body. This pod has held him for 17 months, nurtured his development from a single fertilized cell. Good, good, good. Now it can no longer support his life. The inflow of nutrients and oxygenated blood has ceased. A once comfortable cradle now pinches at his enlarged form. Pushed onto his own faculty, a suffocating urge to thrash wells up inside him. Yet he hesitates. A song booms from the world outside. low frequency vibrates through his whole body. With the certainty of deep imprinting, the calf knows who is calling. It is his mother. She is on the other side. He must join her. The shell containing him is now only a brittle husk, swollen with waste material and straining at the seams. Clumsy first movements form the start of the calf's motor awareness. The egg is evolved to rupture open along a central seam. A few thin cartilage bands are all that retain him. One more forceful effort and he will escape. For that's a studio mod production. South Scrimshaw. Technically speaking, the whale didn't hatch from an egg. Egg is something of a misnomer. <laughs>
While there are known egg-laying mammals, none of them are whales. Okay, let's, what egg-laying mammals? Let's learn about this. There are four extant species of egg-laying mammal. They are the platypus, the echidna, the snorb, and the ribbon snore. Ribbon saw looked almost like uh, it was like it was like like a snake and um, a weasel. This whale species has a placental connection to the mother while developing. Birthing shell is the term currently favored in scientific journals when discussing this style of external womb. The outer cartilage folds backwards, shrinking the space inside and expelling the contents outwards, creating pressure against the inner membrane until it finally pops. The calf spills out into the open ocean. The world is a rush of sensory stimulation. The newborn is momentarily stunned limp. He comes to amid a dizzying flurry of life. Plants and protists tangle and snag his every movement. Small scavengers eagerly devour the cloud of waste. Plants unfurl and retract in almost animalistic locomotion. Foliage clings to the calf from above. He swims deeper to escape. His mother's song reassures him once again, but she is still nowhere in sight. Sponges, wharf biters, crustaceans and corals dangle from the plants like ornaments. Wharf biters. Maybe this is the wharf biter. Let's learn about plants! Plant is not a misnomer. These are true plants. As with so much else in biology, the origin of plants can be traced back to the water. Albeit those early ancestors were far less complex than what we see today. As will be explained later, marine environments impose steep challenges on plants. It was once upon land freed from the burdens of an aquatic life that plants could more readily diversify and form. And it was also after that great proliferation of flowering species that some plants found it more favorable by the water and eventually returned to the seas. They are, in that sense, like whales. Clever. Because if you guys don't under know the real life evolution of whales, is that they look is like, you know, the original land dwellers were amphibians, right? Like fish that went onto land. But mammals came so much further. So, the fact of the matter is that, like, land dwellers evolved into mammals, and then cetaceans were like, fuck this, and they, they just went back into the water. <laughs> In fact, the closest living relative to the whale that still, uh, that still lives on land is the hippopotamus. <laughs> Something solid grabs from below. His descent is halted. He's being lifted back towards the surface. The calf breaches, filling his lungs with their first breath of air. This is the breeding ground of his species. At the year's peak, this wide expanse fills with whales. But today our calf finds the surface empty. Except for a very odd clump of plants. The 
the calf does not know what to make of it. Equally disturbed and compelled, he stares transfixed. Plants continue to tickle his body just below the water. A resident water bug examines him with equal skepticism. <laughs> equal skepticism. Sudden movement atop the leafy mass catches his eye. It's all too frightening for the little one. He retreats back under the surface. His overpowering instinct is to nurse, but he cannot. His exhaustion mounts and fear seizes him. He is lost. And as if sensing his weakness, tendrils begin to grasp at him. A vine lassos his flute, there is no escape. In a final burst of strength, the calf fights, thrashing, tearing and uprooting his attackers. A scent of blood enters the water. His mother cries a pained song to soothe him. The calf is hit with the sudden realization. The strange plants are not taking him away from his mother. The strange plant clod is his mother. The eyeball? The Brillo Whale. Itrixiana Silvifera. Oh, don't worry, it gets interesting. It gets very interesting. Chapter 2 Anatomy. What evidence remained of this year's Brillo breeding season has long since been swept away. This sandbar has returned to its normal, pristine state. Save for one unusual pile of rocks. <laughs> Scanning! Coil charging, coil charging, stand by. This is a stone dog. Somewhat like a hermit crab, this animal lives in a portable shelter of foreign material. It grasps together a shell of scavenged of debris with its long limbs and secrets an adhesive mucus to hold it fast. Stone dogs mostly rely on ambushing prey from a camouflaged position. Right now, this stone dog here is not the hunter, but the hunted. It is a woefully obvious attempt to hide. As the predator stalking it possesses one of the sharpest minds in the ocean. A quick check if the coast is clear. It isn't. <laughs> Our whale calf wants to play, not eat. But from the stone dog's perspective, there's little difference. Oh, it's so adorable. Since hatching, our calf has been a healthy and energetic specimen. Despite his late birth, no complications are detectable. If anything, his cognitive ability is showing swift advancement. He is very fond of holding his fluke above the water surface. Scattered showers are currently moving through the area. The calf has been emerging frequently for visual inspection since the rain began. He seems very interested in the weather above. A long call reminds him not to stray too far. 
Grillos have surprisingly keen vision above the water. The calf is quickly able to spot his mother. This is the farthest distance he has traveled from her. It is more than twice that of yesterday. Today was quite an adventure. Now, reminded of his mother, all this bravery seems to evaporate. He is suddenly anxious to be at her side. He will bring her any interesting objects discovered while exploring. <laughs> and boot it at her face. <laughs> the eye of a woman who is kind of fucking sick of everyone's shit. Also, you can vaguely see her teeth right here from her mouth. I gather that somewhere around here is her open mouth. His mother is trying to rest off another bout of nausea. This play is a bit much. <laughs> but these discomforts are trivial to the bond between mother and child. Our neural interface even shows a measurable relief in her symptoms during these interactions. The calf's carefree play is training for future hunts and the essential skills of survival. But it will be some time before he has to worry about earning meals on his own. His mother's long, prehensile udders reach him through the thorny bramble. The milk he nurses on is thick as yogurt. Calves subsist on this fat-rich diet for two years, building up an insulating layer of blubber. And the bands of spongy tissue for other organisms to burrow into. Here we arrive at what truly makes a Brillo whale such a remarkable specimen for study. Um, CJ, like every single animal on Earth that's really, really fat, that's a mammal, the milk that the calves get, or the babies get, is ludicrously thick. Like, seal milk is, is the same as this. It's literally like as thick as yogurt. It's ridiculous. Because these animals need to be fat. symbiosis of unrivaled complexity and variety. This female was initially selected for study due to her exquisitely beautiful exterior. The mammal is almost totally concealed within the undulating botanical mass. In cross-section, the distinction between whale and passenger is more visible. Scanning. Coil charge. Coil charge. Coil charge. Stand by. That's so fucking awesome. Unlike the stone dog shown earlier, this is not simply an external attachment of foreign material. See the roots going into her blubber? There's her uh, spout. The Brillo whale has an intimate connection to thousands of other living creatures. whale chooses from among a variety of partner species. Not depressing. He chose. He chose to put the plants on her. And offers real estate within designated regions of its body. An inner membrane draws the line between the welcome cohabitation space and the whale's vitals. This unusual arrangement raises several questions, the first of which we will address. What is the benefit of living on a whale? To help us illustrate the principle, we will be assisted by a sea bunny, or sea bun, to use its more common nickname. 
Let's learn about the sea bunny. The South Scrimshaw team has received very explicit direction from our producers, and we are to unequivocally clarify to viewers that the sea bun is not a real animal. <laughs> Isn't that ironic and meta as fuck? The sea bun owes its creation to the original landing party of Kronos 5. World building! Though the specifics are lost, the most convincing story is that it was something misheard over a shoddy radio connection. As those early years recede into contemporary legend, it is important to remember that the tales of hardship told by the first landing party are not exaggerated. The pioneers were indeed isolated for 11 solar cycles. And it was not until the conclusion of the hostilities on Earth that the current biannual delivery schedule could be planned. Hostilities on Earth. You know, in the Alien series, there, in the lore, there was supposedly like a big-ass Earth war. For the reason that I just... It feels very... 1979 Alien. I like it a lot. The uncharted planet was a land of mysterious fauna and unknown environmental hazards. It's technically unconfirmed if Blade Runner and uh, the Alien series are technically connected. Rather than just referent, like there's like references, which isn't the same as it being connected directly. Various examples of sea bun doodle. And it graffiti. was a time where technology seemed to suffer inexplicable <laughs> malfunctions while repair efforts were always undermined by a constant swag. lack of materials, tools, and manpower. The myth of the sea bun serves as caricature for the force of chaos, always at work, when one's back is turned. Sea bunnies was a sort of shorthand for, I don't know what's wrong, it could be anything, including a cryptid. Makes you kind of wonder if it was just bad luck on their part. Or if there was some sort of extra normal thing making all of their stuff malfunction. Among our seniors who were present at the time, one likened the expression to here be dragons on medieval maps. Another drew a parallel with Murphy's Law. Also this one, this is just... This is a... TNT Cable 3. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, either as intentional <laughs> jokes or honest misunderstanding of colourful communiques, word of sea bunnies repeatedly escaped the planet in a way interpreted as fact by those off-world. Compounding this misinformation was a popular hazing ritual where new arrivals were assigned to catch a sea bun for research usually being given a butterfly net and sent somewhere isolated and moderately dangerous. This one is like from Amori. This is Amori sea bun. A unique culture planet side encouraged the escalation of this practice until a few near disasters brought a legislated end to the budding tradition. RESP 0Z42311 to redacted to, from, redacted. I know you guys already understand the gravity of this situation, and I know there isn't malice behind these sorts of pranks. So, we will skip the part where I scold you like children. But understand that I'm mostly planet-side. The brass isn't. They aren't in a position to understand how some FNG got sent on a literal wild goose chase and swept away by the tide. We are all so lucky that Fishing Boat was there to pick him out of the drink. This case is getting closed without any discrepancy, disciplinary sanction. It helps that the kid is being a sport about. It. Regardless, I need everyone at your outpost to consider themselves on probation. I gave some personal assurances to secure this outcome, so my neck is on the line, too. Send my regard to, to Redacted. Redacted was saying the other day how we haven't seen you two for a while. Let's get some horseshoes in before the weather cool. Regards. Regular infrastructure improvements have also blunted the disgruntled sarcasm towards occasional hardship. An official emblem frequently used to mark construction equipment. Civil Corps of Engineers. <laughs> no sea buns. In recent years, the sea bunny is most defined by Will Voynich's cartoons. A tangent of a of a tangent. 
Kids Wilderness is a monthly publication created and edited by Will Voynich, written and illustrated by Voynich and various contributors. Using friendly illustrations, it focuses on natural science, camping, and health and wellness. It joins the official Sunday newspaper as one of the planet's only two print publications. <laughs> only two. Voynich was originally a cartographer and among those first to land with Kronos 5. Children's literature only became a guiding passion after he discovered himself a soon-to-be father and realized how very little would be available for the new generation by way of age-appropriate entertainment and education. On off hours at the Cartographic Survey Computer Lab, using optical scanners and image editing software designed for map making, Voynich painstakingly constructed his first works. Five volumes containing every fable he could remember from his own childhood. While he faithfully retells many of these timeless classics, Voynich's recall is often hazy. Several of the stories are so misremembered, they are more original work than adaptations. Oops. For example, the elephant and the mouse retains nothing from the Aesop tale besides the titular animals. Voynich's version has the two discussing the different sorts of dreams they have while sleeping. This elephant is perfectly square. He is the real. He is the ultimate. Voynich's first intentional works of fiction would be penned for Kids Wilderness. That is how you Adventures pronounce Aesop. Sea what are you talking Marco. about? <laughs> Adventures of Seabun and Monica. Seabun eats the telecommunication network. The accessible charm of Seabun and Monaco found an immediate and enthusiastic audience. Currently playing are musical arrangements from the puppet show adaptation, which has been touring schoolhouses. The songs were composed and performed by Nico Kuprin. The formula of each adventure largely follows the same beats. Seabun, an ocean sprite with impish curiosity and an endless appetite for inedible material, happens upon some unknown piece of infrastructure and decides to devour it. Meanwhile, Monaco, a nervous eel sidekick who always follows Seabun, watches on in comically exaggerated terror while imagining the most nightmarish possible outcomes. These predictions of doom never come to pass. Monica looks like a stone dog. But Seabun's actions do cause significant damage, forcing construction crews to deploy for repairs. Seabun, now realizing his error, uses his supernatural strength to help workers in various ways and atones for his destructive acts. Everything is then rebuilt stronger than before. The story formula seeks to inform young readers about vital infrastructure, where it is found, what happens if it breaks, and the sort of specialized work that maintenance requires. Because he's magic. <laughs> it also seeks to make the harsh edges of a frontier life less frightening and unknown to young readers. Each story ends with the sleepy sea bun returning to his burrow with a souvenir where he slumbers peacefully. That is, until he gets hungry again. Oh, I got an achievement. Deepest lore. Research the sea bunny. Given how entrenched the character has become in the popular consciousness here, we feel it appropriate that the sea bun help guide our exploration of these oceans. That was the whole... We did a double tangent with the sea bun. Now we're back to the question of why would you live on a whale? While each species has its own unique adaptation to this niche lifestyle, we can create several broad categories of benefits such evolution aims to harness. Moving through water takes energy. It is far easier to travel great distance when someone else is doing the swimming. Simply hitching a ride can be greatly beneficial. For example, one species of crab only lives on Brillo whales every other generation and uses whale transportation to greatly expand its range. Guys, did you know that in real life, 
There already are animals that just live on whales. Did you know that? Uh, and it's not just barnacles. Okay, so I'm going to tell you to not Google this, because when I say don't Google this, I mean do not Google this. Do not Google this. You will regret it. Trust me. Whales have a creature that lives on them commonly called whale lice. And they're actually tiny little crustaceans, you know, in comparison to the whale. But it's good to know that in this, in, on this planet, the Brillo whale, at least all their passengers are, um, you know, they're supposed to be there. Unless one is the apex predator, the threat of being eaten is an ever-present reality. If one lives as a potential meal, it is very important to be the least desirable, most difficult of meals. Finding alliance with a giant beast and living under its protection creates a very effective deterrence. It's always still possible to be eaten, but hunters now risk facing off with a leviathan. Some partnerships are more proactive. Certain shark, skates, rays, and scarps have formed hunting partnership with the brillos. What are these noises? Very interesting. They help find and catch quarry, then share in the feast. Pack hunting allows the brillo to take down larger and different sorts of prey. I told you not to Google whale lice. <laughs> The blood or waste of Brillo whales can also provide a source of nourishment. <laughs> the fucking drinking straw sound while it fucking slurps from the whale. <laughs> this not offered freely. Obviously, a Brillo whale cannot stand to be eaten alive. An earth parallel is an oxpecker bird on a rhinoceros. The bird may drink a marginal amount of blood while it cleans off ticks. It's a fair trade for the rhinoceros, as the tick is the far greater threat. So too will a brillo whale expend blood in a beneficial relationship. In several instances, living on a brillo has evolved into part of an organism's life cycle, and the specific conditions regulated in a brillo's body are required for a new generation. Whew, that's fucking crazy. That takes millions of years for you to evolve that your life cycle requires the whale. That's crazy. In some cases, this goes even further. With the biology of the two species becoming so enmeshed, it is unclear where one ends and the other begins. God damn. But these instances are rare. Our research team is very interested if these extreme cases represent a functioning system or the pathological eventuality to such complicated arrangements. All of these riders taking in small amounts adds up to a great expense for the host. This prompts the obvious next question. What does the whale stand to benefit from this arrangement? This is more complicated to respond to. There seems to be as many answers as there are Brillo whales as there is spectacular variety among Brillos. Which you guys are going to see as this goes on. It is so fucking cool. For now, let us approach the answer with specific examples from this mother. The most prominent feature along her body is the wide variety of photosynthesizing organisms. The whale is, of course, not an autotroph producing her own energy from sunlight. But the specialized sea flora pays rent by sharing some of their sugars into her blood. When light is low, roots ferment and alcohol is also created as a byproduct. Certain plants near her head also act as fishing lures, drawing food to her more. While she may occasionally swim deeper, a partially plant-subsidized life has locked her within the photic zone, the upper aquatic layer where enough sunlight can sustain the leaves. 
Adult Brillo behavior and biology is often dramatically influenced by their symbiotic arrangement. Here we see a blood trilobite. This is not an invited guest. A long needle-like proboscis pushes down and taps a vein. Drinking in great volume and offering nothing in return, it is a true parasite. This is a job for the vellum worm. Vellum worms fill their stomachs by grooming brillos of unwanted visitors. It is currently hypothesized that vellum worms distinguish the welcome from the attackers through smell and taste. Parasites have all been found to have elevated amounts of a bile-like brillo waste inside them. This mother brillo also has to worry about creatures browsing her lovely plants. Herbivorous fish attempt frequent raids on the leafy goods. This one is alone and quite oblivious. <laughs> the vellum worm packs a powerful punch for larger animals. A neurotoxin-filled barb is shot into the fish's heart. It can only manage a faint muscle spasm before the venom completes its work. The Brillo whale strategy is called a symbiotic garden. It is an intentionally cultivated arrangement and a precarious balance of mutual reliance. So cool! When successfully maintained, the host becomes a morass of life. It is usually defended from attack. It can sometimes acquire energy in novel ways, and occasionally it is able to invade new niche ecosystems. The universal downside experienced by all Brillos is that more complexity creates more points for failure. An adult Brillo's life is dominated by the struggle to groom a semblance of order into increasingly overgrown flanks. To a simple calf, these adult problems have yet to enter his mind. Today he has found his mother's leaves serve as fun streamers to play with. She finally scolds him. She is too unwell to tolerate any more roughhousing. Just remember the plants are like rooted in her flesh. So he can't just like rip the plants out. That literally just hurts her. <laughs> he doesn't quite understand, but he has other diversions. primarily drinking more of her milk. Given the complexity of Brillo anatomy, even small health problems can swiftly spiral out of control. This female experienced complications while giving birth. There is the potential for the situation to worsen. A thorned branch has become ingrown, puncturing through both the layer of protective outer muscle and the cuticle barrier. Yikes, that must be painful. This had begun prior to carving, but her contractions to extend the womb also caused the plant shard to stab deeper. Ooh. The spikes are now in contact with her intestines. Fortunately, there is no puncture yet. The site is inflamed and white blood cells flood the area. The immune system unmistakably identifies this as an injury. We can witness her stiff reluctance to move and read a jolt in brain activity when she's jostled. It must be greatly painful. The greatest danger right now is a tear of the intestines, which would certainly be fatal. There is reason to hope. Our scans also reveal that she has recovered from a similar injury in the past. Perhaps Brillos regularly endure such ghastly wounds. Perhaps it was the safety of the Brillo herd which afforded her enough time to convalesce. Certainly her odds of survival will be boosted greatly if she is able to make the long swim back. For now, she is still well enough to care for her newborn, though doing so must be exhausting. Judging by several physical indicators, this is most likely her first calf. Those brillos who manage their gardens well can be extremely long-lived. Females can give birth as many as eight times. If the calf survives, 
One day he too might also cast his genes forward, his own minute fingerprint on the future's shape. Regardless of whatever metric of success we observers of an outside species might apply, his life will be led by the means it was forged in the crucible of natural selection. Nature is fucking brutal. But for now, a rare moment of shelter. This is a simplified map of the local ocean topography. Japan? No, it's not Japan. The deep blue represents a fault line, the planetary scar where two tectonic plates meet. As with Earth, this land is a moving crust atop a globe of molten metal. The planet-shaping force of subduction pushed ground up above the sea. This is not Earth. creating what is now named the Chartreuse Archipelago. What a cool fucking name. The island chain runs for about 870 kilometers, drawing a ragged line away from the continent. That's... that's a really fucking far. These names were given by an early survey team assessing the grounds for a harbor or research outpost. Whitaker Island. So this first big island here, this border separating Whitaker, Icklider Point, Hogback, North Sh Scrimshaw, and the rest of the big island here is uh, South Scrimshaw. The body of water created between the Scrimshaw Islands oh. is known as the Thalo Bay. Oh, no Fathalo? Fathalo would be awesome pronounce that as, but, it's, but that's a thing. The large inlet is exactly what a Brillo whale breeding ground requires. Large inlet? So this, this, this small sea. Let's learn about their breeding grounds. Regarding Brillo carving, the most important feature of the bay is the chemical composition and concentration of fungal spores. Fungal? Fungus? For now, we will limit our discussion to the choreography of the breeding ground. Three separate herds converged this year to give birth simultaneously. The dots estimate their prior positions. Huh. Not all brillos make this trek every year, but many more whales assist besides parents. Look how big this planet is! That this tiny little archipelago could have, like, entire herds of whales. The planet might be bigger than Earth. Pregnant whales move into the center, where they maintain as much distance from one another as possible. Perhaps due to the unpredictable anatomy of their fellow brillos, or a vulnerability in the skin of the newborns, calves are kept segregated from all others for the first months of their life. Forms a blockade at the mouth of the bay while the pregnant whales deliver. As weeks pass, hunger and distraction start to erode focus on this task. The amount of time that the herd can wait is finite. When the time comes, all leave together at once, moving with the safety of numbers. Their destination will be one of several coral reefs. Those unable to move on time must be abandoned. Oh. The healthy cannot hazard everyone's odds of survival for the sake of a few infirm. So our, our, our mom got uh, abandoned. Okay. Outside of that season, the whales live elsewhere. Usually they are found at coral reefs and areas more productive with food. Brillos require a very high calorie diet. We now find our whales here, at the border to the Great Vathis Ocean. Oh, what a cool name. It is a bright day in early autumn. An unseasonable cold front chills the air. 
It has seasons. Below the surface, we find our mother bracing for the journey. Judging by her mobility, her health has much improved. The delay is likely not related to her recovering wounds. The distance between the Tharlow Bay and the Southern Reef is inhabited by many large predators. Many Brillo calves are taken in these waters. Her loud songs are searching for another Brillo's response. She has been making these calls since before dawn. She does not want to make this journey alone. The calf returns with a fresh lungful of oxygen. And quickly retreats back to the bramble under his mother. For once he does not need to be told to stay close. Undoubtedly, he can also read the change in his mother's behavior. And the unfamiliar place ahead is deeper and colder. Faintly at first, a new sound reaches them. His mother startles. They both listen. It's another whale. Ah! A Brillo whale, and it is getting nearer. Our mother booms a reply back. The calf's curious nature starts to show itself again. He has yet to meet a Brillo besides his mother. There, he spots something. A large body begins to emerge from the hazy distance. It continues to approach, but the calf still can't quite understand what he's looking at. The calf's curiosity morphs into discomfort the closer it gets. Discomfort turns into outright alarm. He pleads to his mother in distress. She rebukes him in reply as if to say, don't be rude to the new neighbors. <laughs> One cannot blame him for his confusion. <laughs> this Brillo whale's appearance was shaped to be deceptive. This absolute unit. It is a beautiful and ghastly example of mimicry. The way the jaws gently undulate is startlingly believable. The grim exterior is the work of an important symbiotic partner. The weaver lobe. Look at this absolute unit of a bug just sitting here like, yup. <laughs> I did this! <laughs> These prodigious builders turn their colonies into terrifying scarecrows by spinning and sculpting Osama. What's awesome? Osama is a long chain polymer found in great abundance here. It is totally novel to our researchers. When soft, it is similar in texture to a neoprene diving suit. Through a curing process, it can be hardened to various levels. In its stiffest state, it resembles the chitin shell of a beetle. A second documentary team is currently compiling all of the latest discoveries. Let's learn about the second, the second documentary team. Who's this? Building Bugs. Building Bugs. The Corporation for Earth Media presents Building Bugs. I wonder if this dev is also going to make an, a, a second visual novel series about the bugs. That'd be really cool. This multi-part series will focus exclusively on the insect world, which sees far more divergent evolution from Earth species than vertebrates. 
title refers both to insects that build habitats and the evolutionary forces which likely constructed such insects. We hope our simple introduction to this material suffices. Fucking weaver lobe. Cool ass motherfucker. Water is channeled through the layered construction, swelling and emptying various pockets, creating animal-like locomotion. Our resident weaver lobe expert insists that the beastly facade before us here should have taken many decades to complete. <laughs> it also seems unlikely that it was built from scratch on the whale's back. Perhaps if weaver lobes are able to relocate such structures, an established colony was simply carried on to the brillo's back. And there, it's eye right about there. Such a fearsome appearance does much to ward off predators. The reversed head may also help to confuse prey. We do not know why she was left behind, but this Brillo is a valuable addition to the ocean crossing. Maybe she was left behind because she was waiting for the weaver lobe to finish the, the construction. She too is a mother, looking to deliver her child to safety. It seems that all Brillo calves are quite shy around new acquaintances. Our calf growls to himself. Scoldings are unlikely to budge his unwelcoming attitude, nor will the surprise of additional friends. The calf was so distracted by what was in front of him that he failed to notice what was swimming up from behind. She's something like a faceless stone golem. The exterior is more bizarre than menacing. It might serve as some kind of armor, but our crew is at a loss to describe it on first sight. <laughs> like our Brillo mother, this whale may also have some kind of internal injury. She is only able to produce short, abrupt honks instead of complex songs. She is also a mother. Regardless of what benefit her exterior provides, her presence alone will help contribute to a safe crossing. Flanked by these strangers, our calf seems very disturbed. New experiences may be uncomfortable now, but they will lead him to understand the Brillo way. I know, right? It's so cool. His mother jolts him forward with a shove of her branches. It is unlikely that more companions will show up and there is no time left to delay. All following her lead, the six whales head out into the ocean to find their lost herd. Pod is now 57 kilometers from the Great Southern Reef. This is the final leg of their journey, and their path crosses over a wide abyssal trench. My god, it's UFO! Oh no, the little UFOs! What? The parent whales set the pace at a rigorous 6 kilometers an hour. They swim in a typical defensive formation, though with only three adults, it is not possible to fully encircle the youths. The trek has been arduous for our little calf, but he has endured it with admirable stoicism. Slowing down is not an option. He is able to sense this himself. Uh-oh. Something large has been following the whales. It first appeared in the early afternoon and has maintained the same steady distance ever since. Hours passed and the mysterious animal failed to approach or make any concerning moves. The calf's fear of the unknown was slowly overtaken again by interest in his new Brillo companions.
the stony-skinned mother whale and her calf now swim to his left flank. This calf was whining earlier, but seems to have calmed. The stony mother's outer surface has slowly morphed shape throughout the day, greatly reducing in size. I wonder if it's like a slime mold that's encompassing her, that, is, that has just like this calcified surface on it. It is as if the exterior nodules are deflating. What mechanism triggers this change, or how they shrink, we do not know. Overall, she is slightly more streamlined in form than earlier. Perhaps she can intentionally contract her shell for extra mobility. Our calf doesn't know what to make of her either. <laughs> Below him swim the mimic mother whale and her calf. Along with one of our semi-autonomous light drones. Light drones? Let's learn about the light drones. Since the autonomous side of this semi-autonomous drone has chosen to enter frame and spoil the shot, this seems an appropriate moment to talk about some of the machines used in South Scrimshaw's production. Almost all of our remote operated vehicles, ROVs, are surplus from the pacification war. Pacification. When the self-appointed International Coalition declared Earth's intention to globally adopt the doctrine of resistance, they provoked the construction of a war drone fleet. An army of multi-purpose and single-purpose robots was fabricated in less than five days. Due to the brevity of the conflict, limited mostly between Earth factions, and the eventual unconditional capitulation offered, almost none of these war machines saw deployment. Today, all can agree that avoiding a protracted land invasion, or an apocalyptic scenario such as kinetic bombardment, was a necessity. Yeah, there was going to be a war, and so they just created millions of, like, bombing drones in a few days, <laughs> and then immediately the war ended. Today, these robots represent progress and optimism instead of death and coercion. Their strike platforms decommissioned and AI reprogrammed, they are now tools of education and discovery. This declassified schematic illustrates just one of the wonderful drones at our disposal. This is its in internal structure. Array of 500 watt LED. This is one of these types of video games or visual novels that I would be very interested in seeing if there are people on the internet who are like professionals in these different fields, like these science fields, who would like be interested in what this looks like. Like, what would a real engineer think of this looking at it? Would they think it's realistic or just silly? I, I, I don't know, because I'm not an engineer of any kind. <laughs> So this you this this was oh wait if this is a submersible, then that means they com they commissioned the construction of a bunch of drones that like have tiny torpedoes on them. That's crazy. It also makes me wonder though, like what would what war why would the warfare require they have so many submersible drones? Because what's a warship gonna do against this? It doesn't have the payload to destroy something so tiny, but this has the payload to damage a warship, make it sink, you know. I wonder if there are aerial versions of these drones. Maybe not. But it's crazy to think that, like, if all of these drones that were commissioned for the war were all submersible, that means that there are so many, uh, you know, oceanic targets in the Earth oceans in this universe that destroying those targets as a threat was enough to make sure that the war never even really happened. Back to the back to the whales. Swimming upside down is the most uncomfortable spot for a Brillo, and the mimic mother refused to take her turn until minutes ago. Her stubbornness may not be entirely unreasonable. While upside down her disguise as a wide-jawed monster appears to fall apart, 
the illusion of a toothy beast is currently broken. Our calf gets a reassuring hum from his mother. This always seems to quell his unease. He is safe within her nest of thorns. He must focus on swimming. But it's hard to ignore that ominous thing in the distance. This is a penumbra shark. It is the fastest marine animal on the planet. The word penumbra here is very, very menacing. Very menacing. And you're about to see why. For the penumbra, six kilometers an hour is a leisurely pace. It could comfortably stalk the whales days on end. An apex hunter, patient with experience, it will preserve all possible energy for an opportune strike. I still think sharks are fucking awesome, but yeah, they are they are basically just the de facto villain of the ocean. <laughs> Even though they're so fucking cool. Very much like a sailfish, penumbra sharks have a large dorsal fin along their back. This is kept retracted until the moment of attack. With several flicks of the tail, it vanishes from sight. Panic overtakes the whales and the defensive formation immediately breaks apart. The number is like a Greek word for darkness. <laughs> or some shit. That's why it's so that's why it's so intimidating and badass. Our calf looks down. The mimic mother has abandoned her post. Nothing stands between our calf and the open abyss below. The fight or flight reaction is as intense as it is instantaneous. A full threat alarm floods from the hypothalamus, shooting through every nerve and chemical pathway. Adrenaline pumps into the blood. The perception of time dilates. Details of the world suddenly stand out with vivid intensity. Even in this low light, two rows of white teeth are searingly clear. The calf finds his own fins now move in slow motion too. Seawater suddenly feels solid, suspending him in place. Trapped in harm's way, he can only watch the events unfold until a tremble runs through the thorns surrounding him. Again, this reminds me of Amori, the water, the water, the water stuff in Amori. The mother's branches are held under tension and can be released with the force of a catapult. She flexes, cords snap, and in an instant the calf is swaddled in protective barbs and makeshift spears. Woo! The shark senses the change and shifts the attack direction to the stone mother's calf, who is exposed and helpless. Our calf momentarily loses consciousness, but the barbed vines around him act as a net. His mother whisks him away with her. I have goosebumps. This is so... This is way more intense when you're directly paying attention to it, like, from playing it, rather than watching somebody else play it. As our calf comes to again, he finds an awful scent filling the water. He looks back to see what happened to his travel companion. Oh, my... The sight horrifies. It is the reality of predation from the perspective of the prey. Because of his mother, our calf is the survivor, and not the cautionary example for others to learn from. <sighs> Less than 20 kilometers remain until the reef and the safety of their Brillo herd. The Mimic Mother races ahead, leaving the weaker whales to their fate. I don't blame her. <laughs> I don't fucking blame her. The Stone Mother lags behind. Her movements are confused. She is still in a state of shock over the death of her child. Our calf struggles to follow. It is much harder to swim outside of a larger whale's slipstream. And his mother is falling far behind again. He races back to be by her side. The calf has been running ahead of her sight and then returning. 
the back and forth seemed to coax his mother a little further each time. But now her strength has failed. Oh no. She cannot even lift her fins in response. Oh. Her old wounds were opened by the physical exertion to save her child's life. Remember the thorn branch was inside of her body cavity and she had to rip the thorns out to lash them across the baby. So she, well, she will not recover. For her internal organs. He whistles the familiar call to play. There is no more response. She has finally slipped from consciousness. God damn, the art is gorgeous. She cannot remain with her calf any longer. When I was downloading this earlier today, after I woke up, I was like, why is this 1.2 gigabytes? But just look at the fucking art. It's so good. He continues to press for a reaction. Desperation compounds the grief. At this age, calves are completely dependent on a mother's milk and protection. With nowhere to go, the calf remains at her side. The research team witnesses the mother's final pulses of electrical activity fade and extinguish. There is a long pause. Two researchers start a heated discussion on the ethics of intervention. But before any consensus is reached, the argument is interrupted by a low rumble over the hydrophone. The stone mother never left the area. She watches our car from a distance. A new day begins to dawn over the coral reef. Brillo whales start to stir from slumber. Together, the stone mother and our calf have arrived safely. Though physically and emotionally depleted, neither has found any sleep. The calf gorges on milk, famished from the previous day's ordeal. This adoption in the wild may be extraordinary to witness happen, but acts of apparent generosity have not been an uncommon sight to anyone following this intensely social species. It's not a... It Honestly, it's not uncommon in general in real life. In real life, in the wild, this is not uncommon among lots and lots of creatures. It is pretty common. Like, it reminds me of uh, a house cat that adopted a bunch of ducks. Because uh, it uh, just had a litter of kittens, so she was still in the mom mode. So the farmer took these ducks and they gave them to the cat. Because the cat was in like this nurture mood, she didn't she just adopted the fucking ducks. <laughs> that was a weird article when I read it because it was like, the ducks drink her milk, and I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's not uncommon for this to happen, even in the wild. The stone mother's exterior appears to now be fully deflated. We can see a more familiar shape underneath. It's the outline of a young female whale, quite small in size for an adult specimen. She has saved our calf from certain death. Perhaps our calf is helping her continue on too. The young whale finally slumbers. It is good that he takes the moment to recover while he can. He will need the rest. In the morning, he will awaken to an overwhelming new world. So it kind of looks like these giant things here, like, control this armory substance. It makes me wonder what these are. These could be, like, 
almost like a species of giant barnacle or something. That for some reason they have this spreading like capability. Covering her in like a, a slime or a resin. That the underneath of which is probably what gets inflated by the barnacles or whatever the fuck these things. Yeah, she probably can't she probably can't talk very well because she's being there's all this pressure exerted on her when it's inflated because of like the the fluid. Covered in Zerg creep? <laughs> Man. Covered in xenomorph resin. The miracle of Brillos is not that other creatures can live inside the whales. This sort of arrangement is not uncommon. You, the viewing audience, have countless residents inside your own body. Yep, let's learn about the countless residents inside our own body. An adult human is composed of approximately 30 trillion cells. An estimated additional 39 trillion microbial cells, bacteria, viruses and fungi live on and in the average person's body. Medical science has long understood the importance of the microorganisms within us and the role they play in good health. I remember this Alien part. atmospheres are a soup of microorganisms that Earth-raised animals have never encountered before. To the globe-hopping human, the radical change of biome is first felt in the gut. I like this science. I want to see experts, like actual scientists. I want to see actual scientists react to this, South Scrimshaw, and and men, and talk about how how the science works. Known as planetary dysbiosis, arrival sickness, or simply the drags, all off-world-born humans experience an immobilizing nausea soon after entering the new atmosphere. Even with the year-long acclimation program one undergoes in low orbit, the drags cannot be eliminated. Like it's it's like a uh, like it's it's like a jet lag except like ten times worse. Arrival procedure for all travelers includes a period of convalescence at Mercy Star Hospital. Bleach reference. Dysbiosis symptoms last anywhere from fourteen days to six weeks. The worst documented cases persisted for over a year and required intensive care. God. Imagine being nauseated and having really bad shits for a year. <laughs> just so you can just so you can fucking move to another planet where there's more real estate. <laughs> Pictured limnologist and ranger first class Maria Ukichiro. Her 25-day recovery is documented as routine. 25 days is routine! A limnologist? What's a limnologist? Is that like somebody that studies the lymphic system? So she, she's a scientist and she's a ranger in the military. Or the navy or something. Or the, or the space marines. Does anybody else still remember fucking 2017 Donald Trump saying he was going to create the Space Marines? <laughs> In a message to Kronos Earth Branch cadets, RFC Ukichiro warns... Uh, Kronos Earth Branch cadets. So, okay, so Kronos has like a different government, but they aren't completely separated from Earth, if they have a military that is united. Kronos Earth branch, so they have a united military to a certain extent. The initial headaches are too intense to get up and go to the bathroom. In the beginning, you'll mostly suffer on a bedpan. Oh, God! When food isn't coming up or out, you're forcing down a prescribed diet heavy in probiotics. I do mean forcing. The doctors require you to eat certain amounts every day, no matter how nauseated it makes you. Don't think that the kind nurses will let you skip meals either. Your spoon or their tube. Only thing you get to decide. <laughs> the cuisine here is dominated by fermented and preserved foods. You can blame the past shortage of home refrigeration, state of the grid, 
Whatever. Oh, God. Oh, God. They had a refrigeration crisis and all their food is fucked. And they had to preserve it without refrigeration, so it has a bunch of disgusting preservative chemicals that probably taste very, very nasty. Point is, when you inevitably smell yogurt or sauerkraut later, you'll feel violently ill and want to die. Oh, God. Every off-worlder goes through that. You'll get over it. <laughs> See you soon, rookies. I mean, it'd be cool if I could live long enough to go into space, but fucking Christ almighty. If that's how it ends up working, that's going to be a thing. Someone will have to suffer with me, because holy shit. Fucking hell. The miracle of Brillo Whales is their ability to pick and choose their occupants. Our whale will now begin this process of selection. Providing a backdrop for the next chapter is another amazing marine animal whose colorful anatomy can construct whole ecosystems. Our Earth audience will find it a familiar species. It is the reef building coral. I have never in my life understood how coral work. They're an animal, but they don't look they, like, I just don't understand how the fuck they work. Coral is, like, completely lost on me. What does, like, what does one coral organism look like? Is it a bug? Is it a worm? A bikini fish gently picks her way along a mountainous path of calcium carbonate exoskeletons. It's her daily prowl for food, and something tasty has her attention. Plump, bite-sized greebles are entrenched in the nooks below. <laughs> greebles? <laughs> greebles? It'll take her quite a bit of work to pry them out. As the bikili calculates the best approach of attack, her preparations are interrupted. She joins the other fish fleeing for their lives. A what? higher cast of the food chain steals the scene. What? Fuck! It's a spotted barnacle claw. It's a giant barnacle! Poor Greebles. One powerful yank extracts the entire colony hiding below. You know, I'm not gonna lie. You, you wanna know what this Greeble looks like to me? It looks like a giant tardigrade. The way its mouth and the way its limbs look, the only thing that is nothing like a tardigrade is the eyes. And the fact that they're this big. But other than that, they look like giant tardigrades. The host Brillo whale groans with dissatisfaction. This isn't a meal fit for a leviathan. Dude. Fucking hell, dude. Look at this. So the barnacle claw has made its shell over the entirety of the whale. Several of them. This might be one organism, or actually like several uh, sibling organisms. They've constructed an armor all over this whale. They will continue browsing for something more substantial. Our whale watches the drama unfold from a safe distance, somewhat perplexed. This, did this eel get impaled by another barn? This 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 barnacle claw here literally has caught an entire eel for the whale. What the fuck? That is so cool. In the six years since we last rejoined him, the Great Reef has not run short of new surprises. Near and far, one can hear the calls of unknown brillos bounding off these cavernous walls. At least he still has someone familiar to rely on. His adoptive mother is usually out of sight, but never too far away. She has changed quite a great deal God since damn. we last saw her. Look at her now! Look at her! 
perhaps in response to the Penumbra shark attack, she has undergone a zealous application of eye spots to her figure. She is uh, paranoid as fuck. While not as outwardly apparent, our young whale's body has undergone an even more radical change. You can see the outline of his normal dermis, but then the white, this is his new ingrowing dermis for creatures to grow on. His skin layers and immune system have fully developed and are ready to host other species. This dermatological puberty is the crossroad. He must decide what sort of Brillo he will become. How does a young whale make such a crucial decision? The choices are overwhelming, the combinations are infinite, and mistakes are fatal. <laughs> Talk about character customization, am I right? One way to ensure future success of is course. to replicate past success. find a welcoming adult and attempt to fashion themselves in their likeness. The older whale assists with offerings of seeds, eggs, lava and other materials needed to begin the garden. The younger whale remains close for the years after, learning new behavior from the adult. Not every option available to a young whale is desirable. What in the fuck is going on with this guy? It's like he has, like, um, like, leafy coral that's turned into a giant armor, but he also has, like, a frog. Did this frog, like, cons like fold all this, like, these plated corals together? Maybe it, maybe it literally is blind, but it, u but it uses these and, like, the frog's vision. This old-timer is welcoming, but our whale is visibly uncomfortable. Oh, he, oh, he has two- he has more than one frog. Two frogs. It isn't hard to imagine why. <laughs> but on the other hand, another young Brillo might happily accept this body plan. What shapes such individual preference? Realistically, there are far too many influences to chart, but from our limited data, there is one factor that stands out. We estimate that half of Brillos choose to replicate their own mothers. Ah! Our whale displays this preference towards his biological mother. These ribbon plants are the same variety she once wore. Our calf returns here every day. But it is no use. This Brillo whale is deceased. Nothing but a cleaned skeleton remains beneath the foliage. While it is interesting that the garden can partially survive on, none of it can be transferred without the living adult to help. must find comfort in the familiar scent and touch. However, time spent on what he cannot have is time wasted. Waiting too long to start a garden could bring other health complications. I was trying to find- I knew there was a, a section here, but I couldn't see it. Our optics technician noticed a strange blip while alternating camera modes. Zooming in. switching to infrared, show an ordinary thermal image. As expected, the plants are close to the ambient ocean temperature, but after several seconds, the intermittent blinking resumes. Ah. This is an older model IR strobe, typically worn attached to the helmet or vest for identification in emergency situations. Upon retrieving the device and referencing the serial number, we can confirm. This deceased whale was the first Brillo ever encountered by humans. Bruh! The story dates back to the early days of outpost status construction. A fishing boat captain ignored an ominous weather forecast and went to sea collecting crab traps. 
conditions deteriorated faster than his optimistic assumptions. The boat was smashed by a wave while returning to harbour. In the aftermath, two death hands were found missing. Lodestar 1, a heavy aerial command ship able to withstand the violent winds, took off from Vajrapani Airport to begin the search. This plane has like a fucking UFO on top of it. What the fuck? Scanning the roiling wave below, aided by GPS tracker and IR beacons, the two shipmates were located. They were together and clinging for their lives to some unidentified debris. The airplane circled in the turbulent sky above, tracking the men until a rescue helicopter could arrive. After further storm-related delays, RH-307 Kingfisher launched, flying low to keep beneath the still formidable clouds. I really like all the realistic sounds. The following are archive recordings from that day. 307 Kingfisher. Lodestar Tech Sergeant Samantha Anders. 307 Kingfisher, we've updated your arrival coordinates. Confirm you've received. Solid copy, Lodestar. Received. AF pilot, Kingfisher pilot. Our briefing said our guys were hiding in a cave. Is there a PIW? Person in water. Birds are inside some kind of raft. It's the raft that's now moving. Oh, ooh. Okay, got eyes on it now. Visual on the survivor, Captain. Here's here's the survivor, and then here's the giant. Here's the well. You know, we know that this is the whale. But what's this? Is this another whale? Kingfisher Second Officer Marshall Clark. Altitude. Altitude. I see him. Gonna bring as close as I can. Our guy won't be swimming far with these waves. Altitude. Altitude. Copy that. Almost directly over him. Forward 15 feet. Hold. 15 feet. You know what that means, motherfuckers? You know what that means? That means America. Rescue diver's checklist complete. Sending him down. Heads up, Kingfisher. A couple big waves are headed your way. About 20 seconds. Seems like the raft is moving towards us. Oh! What the fuck? <laughs> that was that. Kingfisher? What's your status, Kingfisher? Respond. <laughs> yeah, everyone's all alive for now. If it was gonna eat him, it would have done it already, right? Um, let's get them in the chopper before we find out. <laughs> and there's the baby. Another, there's another one. That must be so scary to you know, like I know that whales are mostly harmless. But I can imagine that if I was out in the ocean and I was snuck up on by a fucking whale, I would piss. Great. Let's start. Any thoughts? Felix, I don't think there, there's any protocol for this in the handbook. <laughs> yeah, hold steady for a moment. I think they, they're coming to us. Can we keep them dead? Hey, can we keep him down? If you want to see monster, then you'll have to feed and walk it yourself. If you want to see monster, you'll have to feed and walk it yourself. Oh, uh, shut you think I'm not old enough to care for a pet? <laughs> Diver's headed back down. I can rescue him progress. <laughs> oh, what a charming fucking little... What a charming visual novel. 307 Kingfisher. Lodestar is peeling off. Good work down there. What a charming... Much visual novel. Much obliged, Lodestar. We'll include you in the highlight reel. <laughs> we'll include you in the highlight reel. <laughs> Play of the game. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, and CC that footage to the bio nerds too. I bet they flip. Bio nerds. <laughs> the bio nerds, here referring to scientists of Station Zeta Laboratories, 
soon received copies of this material. They did indeed flip. <laughs> Our whale goes on a search for another plant-based Brillo. For reasons unknown, such Brillos are conspicuously absent this season. It seems as if anything resembling his mother has migrated elsewhere. One single exception is discovered. Damn! And he is a spectacular example of aquatic foliage. The shaggy coat is as full and beautiful as the late mother's. That is just gorgeous. But not all Brillos are welcoming. Day after day, he tries to draw the adult into play, and day after day receives the cold shoulder. The adult flatly refuses to acknowledge his existence. This male has tunnel vision on the single purpose of mating. Babysitting is not on the agenda. We watch an attempt to woo a female fail pitifully. Oof. She is clearly put off by his little sidekick. Tugging roughly on his leaves. Days of pent-up agitation are suddenly unloaded. Our whale is chased off at the point of a skewer. Little motherfucker! It may feel like a painful sacrifice, but a plant body is not an option. There's a dizzying amount of other choices remaining, and one of them will have to do. Another morning dawns. The nocturnal animals have returned to slumber, and the frantic energy of diurnal animals resumes. For our researchers, every day following the whale is a journey into an uncharted wilderness. Only a small fraction of the species here have been recorded. God there is damn! So much inexplicable behavior to document. Jesus Christ! They are all killing each other. I think this one is the most dead of all. This like little tiny shark here. I think he is just the most dead. Recent discoveries have centered on the varieties of coral present. The reef itself is now understood to be a multi-layered structure. <laughs> There's a reason that animals tend to evolve to crab. Progress and knowledge march forward through tireless work, but we often share in our young whale's bewilderment. Lot of fucking bugs on this whale, right? Who is this? <laughs> what the fuck? You know, this this is really fucking interesting because remember the Brillo whales are uh, they're like sperm whales, but this this outer shell that this whale has has given him baleen. He has baleen, so he can actually eat small organisms in bulk now. What is on his head? What is on his head? What is going on? What is going on? We do not know. <laughs> Our whale runs away, and we simply follow. <laughs> One afternoon, it seems our young whale's persistent searching has been rewarded. A loud song heralds him from the distance. A Brillo hunting party returns. Their high spirits means that all had a good kill. The group's leader is calling to our whale. Ah. Our youth remains in place, but allows the adult to approach. These whales are sophisticated pack hunters. What an interesting design. This sort of, this looks like either armor plating or it looks specifically like a disguise. It can look like a shark. The Chowper, a stupid but friendly shark, totally accepts the Brillos as their own. So, he, so this whale has made himself look like a shark and so these sharks are like, hey, friend. <laughs> Compared to the painful transmogrification other Brillos endure, this silky costume is minimally invasive and provides maximum returns. So he like covered himself in sort of like a foliage silk. And the sharks are just like, yeah, friend. And it's a plant. Yeah. 
this successful symbiosis strategy is limited only by the pack's willingness to share it with others. An open invitation from the leader is a golden opportunity. Nice. Something isn't right. But our whale doesn't like it. Our whale is fixated on the chowper. Ooh. It is a tragedy that our whale seems unable to tolerate sharks of any kind. He flees. Aww. Over the weeks, we observe our subject whale becoming increasingly distressed. It is critical he suppress unpleasant feelings and adopt a symbiosis plan. A Brillo whale cannot survive unplanted. He can perceive himself failing to integrate, of course, but the building internal agitation is not a force that will help him adapt better. Relatable. Autumn draws to a close. Several new varieties of Brillo begin to arrive from colder latitudes. These are mostly hunter archetypes who can live a life less dependent on the reef's concentrated bounty. A camouflaged whale waits for prey to swim near. What in the fuck? It's like a colony of octopuses that are surrounding him and disguising him. Active camouflage or adaptive camouflage refers to skin coloration that can rapidly shift to match a changing environment. These octopus have linked their tentacle nerve endings together. They fuse themselves. Allowing them to network visual information between all bodies. Color change is omnidirectional, instant, and accurate. That is crazy. The swiftness and precision of these changes exceeds any Earth octopus ability. They are not the only example of animals here possessing very advanced skin chromatophores. Researchers hope to understand why they have evolved in more sophisticated fashion than their Earth counterparts. This is some interesting information. First of all, this chameleon is obviously not normal Earth chameleon. While this documentary is restricted to its limited mandate, we believe in good faith that the following question is unavoidable and must now be answered. Administration Region 2, Certificate of Authorization. Convergent evolution was the obvious first hypothesis. This is the phenomenon where different species can evolve similar features when faced with the same evolutionary pressure. For example, we can find similarities in the wings of unrelated flying vertebrates. Similar problems craft similar solutions. While this obviously still holds true, it is not the answer to our question. Yeah, because it, like, how, how do they have DNA that's even vaguely... This lizard looks like an Earth chameleon. This whale looks like an Earth whale. Because they share a recent common ancestor with Earth animals. The true answer is directed panspermia. What is that? It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. So Aristotle advised us. In that high-minded spirit, we can look back at Francis Crick as one of biology's fearless thinkers. He is best known for his work with James Watson, uncovering the structure of DNA more than a century ago. This earned them and Maurice Wilkins the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1962. So, this is at least 2062. Actually, it's, it's at least 2063. He was also uncomfortably acknowledged by 20th century colleagues as a proponent of directed panspermia, that a deliberate extraterrestrial origin to life on Earth should be taken into serious consideration. And so, this part? This part here is why this feels like the alien universe to me. Because this is like Prometheus shit right here, is what this is. While Crick's hypothesis fails to match our current best understanding, his unorthodox thinking landed him closer to the truth than any of his contemporaries could have believed. Unorthodox thinking? That's a Well, I guess we were certainly lucky. And of course, you give the impression you're wrong, Jim. We didn't really do too much thinking. But uh, we were lucky, I think, for two reasons. We, <clears throat> we were thinking about the problem at the right time. 
And then the two of us, by collaborating, when one of us got on the wrong track, the other one could get us out of it. When if if um, I thought there were three, three chains at one stage, you were sure there were two. If uh, you thought that the um, phosphates had to be in the middle, then I would be the devil's advocates and say, put them on the outside. And I think this is very important in solving structures of this kind, because the difficulty is that you've got to give several logical steps, one after the other. If you get go wrong, you get one person gets too fond of their own ideas. I think another thing that which helped us in our collaboration was we weren't at least afraid of being very candid to each other, to the point of being rude. And if you don't have constant interchange and chatting together and saying what you think of the other people's ideas to their face, what a legend. I don't think you can solve problems of this kind. What a legend. Life on Earth originated on Earth. Abiogenesis took place in deep sea hydrothermal vents approximately 3.7 billion years ago. Recent history has revealed that three other planets also sustain life. Aria, Gos and Earth 2 are affectionately referred to as sister planets of Earth due to their similarities. Aria, this is where the Kronos 5 expedition went, so this is the planet we're on, we're on Aria. But it may be more accurate to call them Earth children. They were barren until intentionally planted from Earth's highly evolved genetic stock. Isolated across light years of space, the forces of evolution then wrought divergent results. Who's the genetic stock? Along a different but always familiar timeline, all three bloomed into wonderful new cradles of complex life. Exactly. This brief summary does not do justice to the incomprehensibly convoluted and ongoing <laughs> work of planetary curation. This implies that Ari and Earth shared back and forth. This implies back and forth. This implies goes sent organisms to Earth. But suffice to say, even the professionals struggle to grasp a simplified understanding. This kind of strategy requires a good deal of patience. Our whale, sensing the hunter, swims wide. The camo whale politely hails him. Other Brillo whales aren't the target of his trap. That was a very big tangent, yeah. Our whale replies with mistrust and leaves. Something is wrong. Our whale's once irrepressible curiosity has grown increasingly muted. Even wonders like bioluminescence provokes no reaction. These lamplighter fish are practicing their jousting in preparation for the annual mating competition. The event is soon. It's only a one-night affair, and they will all die immediately afterwards. <laughs> Man, imagine living like this. You live your whole life training to fight until you die so that you can fuck. And then after you fuck, you die anyway. <laughs> We think it would be quite the enriching spectacle. But the fish seem to be of no interest. Our research objectives all involve how a planted brillo changes gene expression throughout its life. An unplanted whale is no use to us. Mm. There is a fear that our biometric implants have been invested on a losing whale. When a gene pool is too small, there is no way for a population to discard deleterious mutations. Without sexual recombination, offspring will have at least as much mutation as their parents. The errors simply accumulate. Muller's ratchet describes a process of irreversible decline, where each generation is one notch less fit than before. Oof. Can all the higher intelligence or wisdom of the universe provide salvation if one's very genetic code is winding down to destruction? The Kronos Project is a late-hour rewrite of a complex genome. It is an attempt to engineer a viable escape from an extinction vortex. Ooh. Humans, still a robust and healthy animal, are conscripted to provide a variety of labour, which our forebearers have grown too enfeebled and small in number to handle themselves. What in the fuck does that mean? 
Now, this could simply be humans talking about themselves. But then, what does it mean our forebears have grown to and feeble and small in number? Of course, we do not do this work without our own motivations. The fruits of this labor could change how we understand illness and aging. But that final objective, to fundamentally decouple our fate from natural machinations and assert the reins of technology, is still widely contested. Oh, that's no brainer, no. We, we, we need to, like, live forever. In contrast to other human enclaves, the constitution of Aria proudly allows this debate to take place in open forums. Oh, that's that interesting. But before we can discuss contingency plans, our Brillo finally begins to break bad habits. This unknown youth has snagged a lamplighter and presents it now to our whale. Perhaps he was enthused to share his catch and our whale happened to be closest. Oh. Brillo interactions can be opaque, but these two have clearly hit it off. For once, our whale does not withdraw. He is proactively engaging instead of passively responding. Oh. It's a much welcome scene, but it begs the question, what changed? What external factors could have contributed to a more outgoing posture? Did our cameras miss a life-changing event? Does this stranger seem less threatening than all the others? It is true that our whale, having been born outside the herd, has consistently lacked peer contact his own age. Young brillos cannot transmit garden organisms between each other, so the interaction here probably feels less fraught. A fucking cuttlefish. Like a melted cuttlefish. Than it might with an adult, who could permanently dose him with life-altering symbiosis. Jesus fucking Christ, what is he? What has this adult done to them? Giant whiskers. What the fuck? We hypothesize that juvenile Brillo association is a necessary prior step to adult interaction. Regardless of how correct this assertion is, it successfully buys our study additional time. The two whales spend the rest of the day playing and are still chasing fish together when we leave them. Night falls. But our whale is not asleep. GPS coordinates show he's swimming somewhere. As his aberrant behavior is still under scrutiny, the team moves to investigate. A spotlight is aimed overboard. We discover more than just our whale. He is traveling with a pod of other youths. They all sing with curiosity at the sudden lights shining from above. We cut the power to avoid further disturbance. It's soon clear where the Brillos are headed. Or, or, or. The first glimmers of action appear in the near distance. The night of the lamplighter fish has begun. The ocean starts to flash brilliantly as males battle for the attention of females. <laughs> the weak are pierced open, spilling bioluminescence into the water. Jesus Christ! They shine with complete indifference to predators attacking. Known as predator satiation, there are simply too many to all be eaten. His belly full of glowing fish bits, a whale watches the show reach its climax. It seems like he'll be up all night with the others. Confident in his safety, we recall our camera drones to finish their scheduled recharge. By blocking wave activity, the barrier reef creates a wide lagoon behind it. The placid water stretches for several kilometers before being overtaken by a mangrove forest. Parts are so shallow that they become exposed to air at low tide. At high tide, other areas are deep enough for a troublesome young whale to get lost in. His friends weren't adventurous enough to follow him today. 
And for good reason, as our whale realizes once the water level starts to drop again. Oops. There's no time to play with the locals. <laughs> the outgoing seawater feeds to several deep channels. Whisked through the trenches, our whale rides the rip current to safety, with no control over where it's taking him. After a lengthy ride, he spat out far from where he began. What a little dumbass. This is the end of the Great Reef. It's exposed and dangerous territory, but our whale can't help himself from having a look around. There's a sudden realization that he's being watched. Something is stirring within the cave behind him. Uh oh. It's another Brillo whale. Huh? Our whale approaches, but there is no friendly greeting. This isolated loner is an exile from the herd. Well, remember that he, he was recovering from his PTSD because he ate a bunch of friends with a bunch of youngsters. Banishment is reserved for excessive violence against fellow Brillos. Most likely, it was a mating joust that escalated to fatal combat. Ooh, this guy... this guy's a killer. Killer! A deteriorated mental state from years of isolation is what has made him truly dangerous. Our Brillo can understand that a noiseless approach signals an attack. He whistles another greeting. It's met with an oppressive silence. The crown of a shark's jaw attests to this whale's staggering strength. Oh, he fucking killed this shark. Oh, fuck. But his secret weapon lies inside the crow's nest atop his hardened armor. Vorpix octopus wakes when it senses a kill is imminent. Oof. He serves the role of a hunting partner who swims in advance. Usually it latches over the eyes of prey and attacks with its serrated beak. Oh man. But when prey is so pitifully weak, he prefers to spectate. Oh man, that's crazy. Our whale is far from being scared. He's experiencing a whole other emotion. He knows. This was unexpected. Huh? Abandoning caution, the calf sings and plays like he's found a new friend. I mean, this guy killed a shark. He wants to be strong enough to kill sharks, too. He goes in for a nuzzle, and the harsh exterior cracks. How long has it been since the old-timer experienced any warmth of companionship? Maybe having a little apprentice killer won't be so bad. <laughs> he grunts, struggling to remember a song that isn't also a threat. This isn't the scene of bloodshed that the octopus wanted. Oh my god. It seems he's witnessed this cycle once before, as he knows what must be done. Witnessed the cycle before? This animal is negligibly senescent, meaning it expresses no evidence of biological aging. It's one of the only long-lived cephalopods that has not been culled. Oh, what? Why would they cull other cephalopods? That's interesting. Our researchers suspect this octopus to be at least four centuries old. Holy shit. And cephalopods who survive so long possess a devious intelligence. Holy shit. I mean, let's be real here. Cephalopods are just like floating brains in the water with, with, like, te with like arms. That's all they are. They're just a floating brain with arms. That's what cephalopods are, you know? So it's, it's obvious that if they live a very long time, they're going to be ridiculously... The Vorpix presents our whale with a living piece of the armor plating. Mm. A quick feel for the soft spot. And the deed is 
done. <laughs> when the young whale wakes up, the implant will already have sprouted roots to hold firmly fixed in his skin. With this major milestone now documented, the mobile lab departs and will not rejoin the whale again until his adulthood. Implants will continue to transmit information about his physical development for a 20-year remote observation period. Damn. This also ends the documentary team's access to the whale and concludes the first phase of our project. For us, raw data is far less compelling than first-hand observation of his body being reconstructed. Twenty years is a long time for impatient humans to wait. When we do meet our whale again, it is hard to guess now what we might find. All the changes he experiences over two decades will be witnessed in a single moment. Oof. It should be nothing short of a complete metamorphosis. This is the coolest shit ever, guys. So good. This concludes South Scrimshaw Part 1. Please keep designated channels open for the transmission of Part 2. Hmm. Industry Region 2. Sensor Submission. I knew that it would uh, probably take more than two hours, and I was going to finish it no matter what. Written and illustrated by Nathan O'Marsh. Bunch of free sound. Very well constructed. Who goes to bed? What? I'm not going to bed. Special thanks to National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and National Park Service for their t public domain recording. That's what they got. That's what they got the the thing of Francis Crick. All right, and there you have it.